again. Let us bow our heads for the prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this time. Be with us, guide us the Holy Spirit throughout this process. And we thank you for the evangelistic series. We thank you for guiding us with your Holy Spirit, O oh Lord. We pray all this, trusting and believing in your holy name. Amen. The first song we're going to sing is song number 184. Jesus paid it all. Yeah. 
Dear Faith and Lamsey Church family, our online viewers via YouTube and Facebook throughout the world, a warm welcome to you all and a happy Sabbath. We are glad that you have decided to join us in this evangelistic series that is beginning today. First and foremost, I want to thank our Heavenly Father, the creator of the universe, the omnipotent God, and our Redeemer, for his unfathomable love and unfailing grace. When you pause and think of the thousands of lives that have been lost during this pandemic time, Indeed, you can agree with me that a divine privilege has been extended to us. That is perhaps the reason as to why we arrive. And because the divine privilege has been extended to us, we need to be more focused in doing the ministry that the Lord has committed to us, as the Apostle Paul reminds us in the book of Acts 20, verse 24, that life is waterless unless we do the work that has been assigned to us by the Lord Jesus Christ, the work of sharing the good news of the kingdom and the wonderful grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Secondly, from today, and indeed for the next 21 days, we'll be sharing that great news from this platform. The good news that will bring hope and a rejuvenation to the dying world. The good news about the blessed hope the hope of our return of our Lord and Lords and the King of Kings and our forever friend. It is my hope and a prayer that in the course of these three weeks you will pray for this campaign. You will support this campaign financially. And you will read someone to Jesus. Take that responsibility. We all work together to read some soul to the Savior. Thirdly, allow me to share with you the program that we will adhere to for the next 21 days. The children have their program beginning from 5.30 to 6.30. Please, you will have the links and tune in and see the program that they are having. The youths will also have their program from 5 to 5.45 p.m. Our main program begins at 5.45 to 8 p.m. Please adhere to those timings for they are important. From 5.45 to 6 p.m. we have song service and except for today, beginning tomorrow, we will have the first speaker. And we have divided these 21 days, or we have shared these 21 days with three speakers. We have family life beginning tomorrow, and the second week we have health, and the third week we have finance. So please make sure that you follow what is happening so that you don't miss anything. And from 7 to 8, we will have the main sermon from our speaker, Pastor Landskid. May God bless you 
as you participate in this grand evangelistic campaign. And I hope at the end of this campaign, we will see the end of God. We believe that God will protect us and will protect you as you participate. And we know that God is going to bring many more souls in these 21 days. Now I want to take the opportunity and introduce our guest speaker. Our guest speaker is Pastor Landskid. He's a graduate of Oakwood University. He's also a graduate of Theological Seminary at Andrews University. He has served as ten he has served for ten years as director of the Office of Enlichment at the University of Michigan Medical School. He has worked as Salvation Army as a social worker. He has done self-supporting international evangelism for the last 20 years. And he has also done self-supporting evangelism for Michigan Conference and Lake Michigan Conference too. He's married, one wife made this, and he lives in Ann Arbor, Michigan. That is the guest who will be speaking to us for the 21 days. And we pray that God may use him mightily as he brings his word to us. Now to officially open this campaign, I will call the district pastor, Eric Mokua, to do a prayer of dedication and commitment as we begin the serious work of winning souls to God's kingdom. May you arise and let's have a dedication prayer. Wherever you are, those who are in church, if you are able to kneel down, you can stand up. Maybe you're in your house, I would like to request you to pause for a moment as we seek the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, the Lord of the universe, the creator of mankind, and the recreator of us all at the cross of Calvary. We have chosen to pause for a moment in your presence, for we are rest assured in your presence there is fullness of life, joy, and peace. We are in your presence because you have ushered us into your presence, and that's the reason we have come boldly, for we are rest assured that we'll find grace and mercy. Thank you and thank you, O oh Heavenly Father, for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who came and died for us, and because of him, we enjoy being in the newness of life. We are so very much excited, for you have given us work to do for you. We have chosen to serve you. We have chosen to lift you and up so that you may draw all men and women to yourself. Father God, what a joy to be used of you. We at Faith Church International and Ramsey, a Seventh-day Adventist District churches, we have set apart the three weeks to trumpet hope for the dying world. People around us have lost hope. People around us are looking for meaning in life. But we thank you because you are, you are the answer to every question. Lord, we are here to ask you to journey with us. As we begin this evangelistic campaign, may your presence be with us. How we pray that, Lord, you may protect this instrument with the blood of Jesus Christ. How we ask you that you may protect us from the snares of the evil one, including the COVID-19. Lord, we know that we will make it because of you. We know that you will be with us. We know 
that the Holy Spirit will be with us. And I thank you, Heavenly Father, because we have done our part. We have sent the missionaries out for the last uh, one week. They have knocked doors, they have gone on the highways and the byways from house to house. Even we have seen, we have almost 50 people who have shown interest. And Father, I ask you, Lord, to journey with us in this time of soul harvesting. We thank you because your word is yes and amen. We thank you because you have promised to be with us to the very end. May you receive honor and glory. I want to commit your man servant into your able hands every evening and on Sabbath during the divine service when he stands to break the bread of life. May you use him in a mighty way the way you have used him in the time past. We thank you, Lord, because you have promised to be with him. And here we are ready to hear your word. Speak to us, O Jehovah God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen and amen. happy to be here in this Sabbath evening. And we're going to sing a song that's talking about how God is calling us to go and call those people who are out there to be fishers of men and bring him back to the kingdom. We're going to sing it in Swahili and I hope you'll be blessed.
Sabbath, everyone, and for those of you joining us via YouTube or Facebook, wherever you are, we also wish you a very happy Sabbath, and we thank you very much for connecting with us. We thank God that we have the capability to reach the four corners of the world without benefit of passport or travel documents. We thank God for that. I particularly want to extend a welcome to anyone watching who is not a Seventh-day Adventist, thank you very much for taking the time to fellowship with us. May the Lord bless you endlessly and place a double blessing on your children. We are honored by your presence with us tonight. We're coming to you from Minnesota, the city of Minneapolis, Brooklyn Park to be precise. But wherever you are, the Spirit of God can reach you because this is God's world. We'll be here every night, same time, same place, and we hope that you will so arrange your affairs that you will be able to join us as often as God will allow you. I extend a special welcome to those watching us from Kenya, and I say that because the host church is predominantly a Kenyan church, 
and many Kenyan friends have written me saying please greet the members for me and so I greet you from all God's people in the land of Kenya and wherever else they may be but whatever country is represented by the listening audience we thank you and may the Lord bless you may the Lord bless your leaders and help them always to understand in all that they do that righteousness exalteth a nation it really really works it is seldom tried but it really works righteousness exalteth a nation our subject for tonight misfits and mismatches misfits and mismatches before I proceed any further perhaps there's someone in this building who is not a Seventh-day Adventist if that's the case I'd like to see your hand is there anyone with us in this building tonight you are not a Seventh-day Adventist may I see your hand anyone you are not a Seventh-day Adventist where would you kindly tell us your name, please? John, that's a good Bible name. How are you, John? It's very good to see you. Who invited you, John? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for accepting the invitation. We are honored by your presence. And John, may the Lord bless you through this message and bless your life in everything you do and extend that blessing to your family. Let us say amen for John. Amen. Say it again. Amen. One more time. Amen. God is good. And all the time, our subject for tonight, misfits and mismatches. Before I go any further, I'll ask you please, if you do not need one of these things, then turn them off. And let's just use one of these because these things don't ring. Can you say amen? And you don't need to plug them in. They come fully powered at all times. That's if it's possible. If this is all you have, just make sure it does not make a noise. The second favor I ask is that you pray for me while I'm speaking. All I want you to say is, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. And whatever I say to this audience in my presence, I am saying to God's people watching via Facebook and YouTube, say a prayer for me and just say to God, Lord, Put your words in that man's mouth. That request is based on Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, which says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And I really with all my heart want God to put his words in my mind and in my mouth. And the third favor I ask, it may sound strange, but I'll ask it, think. As you listen to the words, think. Isaiah 118, come now, let us do what? Reason together, saith the Lord. This tells us immediately that the God of Calvary, the God of creation, the God that you and I serve is a reasonable God. And he invites us, come now, let us reason together. And so engage your mind as you listen tonight. God has given us minds, tremendous gifts, to be used, of course, to understand his truth and to glorify him in that truth. Let's bow our heads now and pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of life. Thank you, dear God, that in this country and many countries around the world, we still enjoy freedom of worship. Thank you, dear God, for bringing your sons and your daughters safely to this place. And those who may have gathered in different locations around the world to connect to this service, Father, we thank you for their protection. As I prepare to deliver this message, dear God, I ask in the name of Jesus to cleanse me from sin. Forgive me thoroughly, Father, that I may be an instrument in your hands that you may use effectively. I humble myself before you, dear God, I really do. And I ask you to speak through me let your spirit possess my faculties, dear God, and literally speak through me. Remember the promise you made to Moses in Exodus 4 verse 12 when you said to him, Now therefore go and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. Do that for me, dear God, I pray. In a very special way, God bless all our guests who are not Adventists, wherever they are. Brother John who's present with us and so many listening via YouTube and Facebook. Father, we commit this service to your glory. 
May your name be praised by the proclamation of the truth. Bless this host country of the United States. Guide the thinking of the leaders their God, that the decisions and choices they make may be advantageous to the gospel. Thank you for the honor of speaking for you. I offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Our subject, misfits and mismatches. Genesis 1, reading from verse 1. Genesis 1, reading from verse 1. The Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There are about 31,102 verses in the Bible, and this is my favorite. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Let's find out something about the heaven. Psalm 19, reading from verse 1. Psalm 19, reading from verse 1. Our subject, misfits and mismatches. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament sheweth his handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech, and night unto night sheweth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. The Bible tells us that the heavens and all that is in the heavens silently, without the use of words, proclaim the glory of God, the majesty of God. The architectural wizardry of God, if I may use the word wizardry, the design, the beauty of God as a designer, the heavens declare the glory of God. Genesis 1 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, combined those two verses, and we can conclude safely that when God made the heavens, He made it for His glory. We go now to Isaiah chapter 6. We'll read from verse 1. Isaiah 6, reading from verse 1. Our subject, misfits and mismatches. And I hope you're thinking rigorously. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. Verse 3, and one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. I repeat, the last part of verse 3 of Isaiah 6, the whole earth is full of his glory. We discovered in Psalm 19 verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. And we learned earlier that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. What we may conclude correctly is that when God made heaven and earth, God made heaven and earth to glorify him. When we read, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, we know that part of creation on the earth was the creation of mankind. Why were they created? Let's go to Isaiah 43. We read verses 6 and 7. Our subject, misfits and mismatches. Isaiah 43, 6 and 7. Before we read, I will pray again. Father, as I continue to speak for you today, God, tighten your grip on my mind that truly my words are your words. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I will say unto the north, give up. And to the south, keep not back. Gather my sons unto me and my daughters from the ends of the earth. God is telling Isaiah that they will come when he will gather all the Israelites who were scattered because of captivity. Even everyone that is called by my name, verse 7. For I have created him for my glory. I have formed him. I have made him. The Bible is clear and precise. Humanity was made for the glory of God. The heavens were made for the glory of God. The earth was made 
for the glory of God. I am not using verses that speak symbolically. I am using verses that express literal truth. Creation was designed to glorify God. In 1 Corinthians 10.31, we have a message to those of us. We're now in a land of sin, but the message still applies. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. This was God's will from creation when he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. The image of God, which is the glory of God, has no sin. I repeat, heaven, earth, and everything therein were all created, including humanity, for the glory of God, for the service of God. Let me explain what I mean by for the service of God. Go to Psalm 104. Let's read verse 14. Psalm 104, verse 14. Our subject Misfits and mismatches. The 104th Psalm, verse 14. The Bible says, He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle, and herbs for the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth. A casual reading will deprive us of what is being said. The Bible says, He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle. It is God that causes grass to grow. Let's go to Exodus 14. Let's read verse 21. Exodus 14. No, let's go to Matthew 5. Go to Matthew 5. We may get back to Exodus 14. Matthew 5. We read verse 45. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount. Do you have Matthew 5, 45 reading? That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. The Bible says it is God that causes the sun to rise. The sun does not rise of its own. The rain does not fall of its own. I repeat you, I am speaking literally. God is in control of all of nature. Nature's function is to glorify God. And you're probably wondering why am I making this point over and over and over. And why the title misfits and mismatches. Nature is God's instrument to do his will. Let me give you a biblical example. Go to Mark chapter 4. We'll read from verse 37. Mark 4, reading from verse 37, our subject misfits and mismatches. Mark is the second gospel of the New Testament. Mark 4, reading from verse 37, we're looking at nature serving God, doing God's will. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they wake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Verse 39. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Again, I am reading literally, not symbolically, Jesus, who by the way is the creator, he rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. They carried out the will of God. Let the Bible try to convince you because you look distinctly unconvinced. 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17. First Kings 17. We read from verse 1. And Elisha the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, 
as the Lord God of heaven liveth before whom I stand. There shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and dwell hide thyself by the brook Kerith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook. Now read the last part of verse 4 very carefully. And I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. I have commanded the ravens. Now read verse 6. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening. The ravens carried out the will of God. All of nature, all of creation is designed to carry out the will of God. Let's go to Second Chronicles chapter 7. We read verse 14, verse 13. We're all familiar with verse 14. If my people which are called by thy name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. But we'll read 13. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter 7, our subject, misfits and mismatches. Let me pray again. Dear God, continue to be with me, I pray. Dear God, suppress my carnal nature and let my only purpose be your glory and the enlightenment of your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain. And if I command the locusts to devour the land. God is saying, I can command the locusts. And for those of us from Kenya, East Africa, and other places, the Middle East, we know the devastation locusts can do. God said, look, if I shut up heaven, and according to Isaiah chapter 5, verse 6, God shuts up heaven by commanding the clouds to rain no rain. He commands the clouds not to rain. That's how he shuts up heaven. And so he says, if I shut up heaven, that there be no rain. Or if I command the locusts to devour the land, they will carry out the will of God. As verily as the wind did what God said, the waves did what God said, the ravens did what God said. They carried out the will of God. This is the purpose for all of creation, including humanity. To be instruments in the hands of God for the carrying out of God's will and for bringing glory to God now. Having said that, listen again to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, what does the Bible say about God? The Bible says God is love. 1 John 4.8. It is repeated in 1 John 4.16. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. A God of love, whatever he produces, is an act of love. The Bible says in Psalm 147 verse 17, God is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. Whatever God does is an expression of righteousness and holiness, including creation. When God made Adam and Eve, he said, let us make man in our image. Now, 1 John 3 verse 5 says, and we know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. There is no sin in God. Somebody say amen. There is no sin in God. Which means when God said, let us make man in our image, we can conclude God made sinless beings, and it was God's intention that they would live that way. Our subject is mismatches, misfits and mismatches. God puts sinless being in a sinless world. They sinned and all of creation was affected by the sin of Adam. And so the Bible says, wherefore as by one man, sin entered into the world. This world carries the curse of sin because mankind made in God's image sinned. And by introducing sin into the world... Something was introduced that made Adam and Eve misfits. Were it not for the plan of salvation, Adam and Eve, because of sin, 
were misfits because sin does not belong in a world God designed to be a sinless world. That is why the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And righteousness is the very opposite of sin. What am I saying? I am saying this. When God made the world and God made mankind, it was God's desire that sinless people would live in a sinless world and thereby glorify God. Sin entered. God is not glorified by sin. With sin came death. With sin came sickness. With sin came war. With sin came divorce. With sin came drought. With sin came floods. With sin came plagues. With sin came all kinds of curses that have bedeviled this world from the fall of Adam until now in increasing ferocity. Why? Because something happened that disturbed God's arrangement. That thing is sin. God's arrangement was that mankind would live, would so live that their lives would be a constant expression of glory to God. And since the world was put under man's dominion, so would nature be a constant symphony of glory to God. Sin interfered with that. And so we have all manner of calamities, sin, disaster, and ruin. The problem is so serious that God had to send someone equal with himself to fix this problem. Because sin makes us misfits in God's system. God's system is my glory, my glory, my glory. No glory comes to God through sin. I repeat, no glory comes to God through sin. The only person who, I hate to use the word benefits, but who delights in sin is Satan. No glory comes to God through sin. And so every sin is an opposition to God's system whereby the universe, nature, mankind would glorify God. Sin interrupted that. From then until now. God sent his son Jesus Christ to die, to pay the penalty for sin. As I said, sin was such a major problem, only someone equal with God could come to solve the problem. The problem is solved in the life of the believer who accepts Jesus Christ. But even though the problem is solved in the life of the one who accepts and surrenders to Christ 100%, there is still evidence of sin wherever we turn. There are still those who reject Jesus Christ. There are still wars. Good people still die. Good people die of coronavirus. There are still problems plaguing the world despite the fact that Christ has come and through his sacrifice, anyone who accepts him will have the sin problem solved in his or her life. But it does not make this world a sinless world. God's original purpose was heaven and earth will glorify him. A polluted stream does not glorify God. A destroyed forest does not glorify God. And the worst form of disgrace to God is not so much a polluted stream and a destroyed forest, but a practicing sinner. The problem with the world today is the problem with the world in the days of Noah. That problem is sin. God introduced order, symphony, design. Sin introduced Discord, anarchy, chaos, and ruin. And a sinner is a misfit with regard to God's arrangement for this world. I repeat, a sinner is a misfit and a mismatch in a system which God designed to glorify him. And so Jesus has to come to fix this problem. He came once to fix the problem of sin in the life. 
He has to come back to remove the problem of sin from our surroundings. Let me say that again. The heavens and the earth, creation, are to glorify God. We were made to glorify God. When Jesus died, he provided the power, the means whereby the individual can achieve victory over sin. And that is done before he comes. But he has to come to deliver nature, the world, from the curse of sin so that his original plan of sinless people in a sinless world might be resurrected. Go to 2 Peter chapter 3. Let me show you what I mean. Our subject, misfits and mismatches. 2 Peter 3, reading from verse 10. I'll pray again, dear God. Continue to speak through me, Father. Help me to listen to the Spirit and obey Him when He tells me, say this or say that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Now listen carefully. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Let's read that verse again. Just before we read it, let me refresh your memory. The heavens declare the glory of God. That was his arrangement. The earth is full of the glory of God. That was his arrangement. Because of sin, God has to come back and purify the heaven and the earth. Listen to the verse. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. That's heavens, the atmosphere. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Go to verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for what? New heaven. Come on. And new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness you can conclude because righteousness does not dwell in this earth as a dominant feature of life let me say it again the dominant feature of earthly life is not righteousness if that were the case there would have been no need for christ to come and establish a society of righteousness verse 13 says nevertheless we according to his promise look for new heavens we're going back to the original and the new earth, going back to the original, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And righteousness is not something a tree does or a mountain does. Righteousness is a life expressed by those made in God's image. And so there is the restoration of the heavens glorifying God. The earth glorifying God. And most importantly, humanity glorifying God. Let me repeat, the problem with this world is sin. Let me be more specific. We have this problem called coronavirus, and I have my mask with me. As soon as I get off the pulpit, I will put it on. Not because I have no faith, but when I get a cut, I put a band-aid on the cut. Are you with me? To keep infections from the cut. So I put one here to keep infections from going into my nose and my mouth. Now, we are here. We're bothered by coronavirus, over 4 million cases in the United States, infections, over 150,000 dead, many more around the world. The mask is good. Wear it. Uh, social distances, fine. Do that. Wash your hands often. Do that. But this does not solve the problem of sin. If COVID is conquered, another disease will rise. Be until sin is conquered, we go from one sin to the next, or one disease to the next, one war to the next. I believe World War I was designed to end all wars, or was it World War II? We've had since then the Korean War, the Vietnam War, all kinds of wars. There are so many wars going on now, the, the, the media no longer talks about them because they're not worthy of ratings. Let me repeat. <laughs> this keeps the coronavirus out of your nose, supposedly. So does social distancing and washing your hands. This does not solve the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is sin. 
and someone who eats a vegan diet and exercises and sleeps at 8 o'clock and wakes up at 4 o'clock with, with the fowls and the cocks and whatever else, that person who does not give the life to Christ is still contributing to a sinful world. This world needs to understand that the problem is sin. Let me add to that. When I say the problem is sin, what do I mean? Here's what I mean. The Bible says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. This world is in the condition it is in because the world has largely ignored the law of God. This is from Adam until now. You won't hear this on CNN, because this is biblical. But the Christian does not look at a problem first from a sociological or the epidemiological perspective. The Christian looks from a biblical perspective. This is the foundational perspective that puts everything in its proper place. Sin. Christ is coming back to solve the sin problem, not the coronavirus problem, the sin problem. Coronavirus is an expression of sin. You see, if you've got a cold, you can blow your nose from now until tomorrow. That does not cure the cold. Blowing your nose does not cure a cold. You need to fix what's on the inside that has compromised the immune system, causing you to have a cold. Blood tissues do not cure colds. And masks do not cure sin. Wear them, don't misunderstand me, they do not cure sin. What I'm saying for the umpteenth time to the point of irritation, the problem is sin expressed differently. The problem is we are living outside of the plan that God originally put in place. That his glory would be the reason why we live. His glory is the reason for heavens. His glory is the reason for the earth. Anyone living outside with that arrangement is a misfit and a mismatch. And so the Apostle Paul says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? They don't fit. And what communion hath light with darkness? They don't fit. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? They don't fit. Or what part hath a believer, he that believeth, with an infidel? They don't fit. Or what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? They don't fit. Put together, they are mismatches. When God made light on the first day, let me pray again. Father, speak through me, please. Simply, directly, and powerfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Apply the minds you have, sharp minds. Listen. And God said, Genesis 1, 3, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. Listen again. And God saw the light, that it was good. He did not say that about the darkness. God is teaching us through the physical creation of light that light and darkness are misfits, mismatches, and they must be kept separate. Of course, the spiritual lesson is the believer has to keep himself or herself from the impurities of the world. And so Paul, borrowing from Genesis 1, 3, and 4, he writes, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship? Hath righteousness with unrighteousness, they do not match. What communion hath light with darkness, they do not match. Or what concord hath Christ with Belial, a name for the devil, they don't match. Or what part hath the he that believeth with an idol, with an infidel, they don't match. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols, they do not match. Let me give you some good news. Your presence tells me you believe, in, you believe in the word of God. You have some respect for God. When someone gives his or her life to Christ, seriously, that person becomes a misfit. 
the person is a misfit. Listen to what the Bible says about Abraham and the patriarchs. Go to Hebrews 11. Let's read from verse 13. Hebrews 11, reading from verse 13, our subject, misfits and mismatches. Hebrews 11, reading from verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, not having received them, but were persuaded of them and embraced them. They saw them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. What's a stranger? He doesn't belong. When I travel and I have to go outside, I try to make sure I'm with someone local. Because the local people can spot immediately this guy doesn't belong. Even when you go to downtown Detroit, close to where I live, and that the guys can detect, no, he doesn't belong. He's a misfit. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, they confessed they were strangers and pilgrims. Why? Because they were God's children. Misfits on the earth. And what does the Bible say of Abraham? He looked for a city which hath foundation, whose builder and maker is God. Verse 10 of Hebrews 11. We, my brothers and sisters, are living in a world that is in opposite direction from God's original plan, which was that everything would glorify God. Nature and humanity made in the image of God. I have told you tonight more than once, the problem with the world is sin. But let me be even clearer. I am not saying everyone who's contracted COVID-19 is because that person committed a sin. I'm not saying that at all. Jesus died because of sin and he never sinned. Let me say it again. Jesus died because of sin, but he never sinned. There may be someone carrying a baby and the doctors have determined something is wrong with the baby in the womb. The baby has made no moral choice to sin, but the baby is affected by coming into a sinful system, which is this world. People of God suffer because they live in a world of sin. Not necessarily because they sin. You go to any hospital, you'll find genuine Christians. You go to the morgue, you'll find the bodies of genuine Christians. Because we live in a world of sin and the, the early patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. They realized they were misfits on the earth, but they were misfits in the right direction. There are misfits in the wrong direction. A sinner is a misfit because he or she goes against God's original plan. A believer is a misfit because he or she is in a world that is dominated by sin. Misfits, mismatches. Every one of us is a misfit. But we have to decide in which direction. When Jesus rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, peace be still, the disciples said, what manner of man is this? He was a misfit. That's why his life was so short. They couldn't take it. You and I have to be misfits in this world of sin. A misfit by allowing Jesus Christ to direct the life. This world will get worse. The Bible says that. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. If you think COVID-19 is bad, it will get worse, whether by a disease or natural disasters or wars, it will get worse because the Bible says so. You may solve... A problem, let's say, in Spain. And a problem pop pops up in Chile. You solve a problem in Chile, a problem pops up in uh, Croatia. You solve a problem in Croatia, a problem pops up in Argentina. As long as there is sin in the world, there will be problems, calamities, suffering, and ultimately death. What's the answer? The return of Christ. But before Christ comes, how do you and I secure ourselves? We give our lives into the hand of the one who originally said, let us make man 
in our own image. My brothers and sisters, listen to me carefully. Your only defense, your only protection, your only insurance against the worsening conditions to come is to connect with Jesus Christ. Because he came as one of us, conquered sin. He suffered because he lived a life of sin. He was hungry, he was tired, he was beaten, he bled, he was embarrassed, he was disgraced. He suffered from living in a, life, in a world of sin, but he conquered sin, and that victorious life is available to you and to me, that we might live victoriously, and by so doing, harmonize with God's original plan. Let me review. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Why? For his glory. The earth for his glory. Human beings for his glory. This was God's plan and it remains God's plan. Sin entered the picture and caused ruin. Jesus Christ came and made it possible for us to conquer sin. But he has to come back and deliver us from a sinful environment because originally God placed sinless people in a sinless world and he is taking us back to that situation that setting that arrangement and while Christ delays his coming out of mercy the world has two kinds of misfits and mismatches the sinner is the misfit as regards God's system the believer is a misfit in a sinful world and so Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. You must be a misfit in your classroom. You must be a misfit in your office. You may have to be a misfit in your family. Because you've chosen to walk with Christ. But an intelligent person lives today but keeps an eye on tomorrow. In case I live to see tomorrow, I don't want to come to tomorrow unprepared. And the tomorrow I'm talking about is the return of Jesus Christ. And when that day comes, there will be no time for getting ready. The getting ready period is now. My friends, let me close by being repetitious again. Misfits, mismatches. A sinner is a misfit for the kingdom of God. I give you the verses I read before. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night into which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, what are the works? The gambling, the horror houses, men marrying men, women marrying women, people marrying animals, all of that, the lifestyle of a sinful world, the works, the earth, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Verse 13 says, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, Wherein dwelleth righteousness. My brothers and sisters, there's a world coming with no sickness. Somebody say amen. There's a world coming with no war. There is a world coming with no death. No hospitals. No policemen killing people. Or people killing policemen. No drones dropping bombs on people. No explosions as was in Beirut. No prisons. Nothing of the kind. Wherein dwelleth right. And righteousness is not idleness. Righteousness simply means everything is done to please God. Everything is done to please God. This was God's arrangement. This is God's arrangement. And I say again, by giving the life to Jesus Christ, Christ prepares you to be a misfit in this world that you may fit in the world to come. Let me say it again. Christ prepares us to be misfits in this world that we may fit the world to come. As your brother, as your friend, as your speaker, wherever you are, make a conscious choice to ask God to come into your heart and direct your life. And you may ask me, how do I do that? Just tell him, Father, I cannot save myself. Send me your spirit into my life. Direct my life. Take control of my life. You just say that with all your heart. And God will direct your life. 
And you repeat that every day. Father, come into my life through the Spirit and direct me every day. Renew it. It takes five seconds, ten seconds. As you do that and you study the Word of God and pray, God will make you fit for His kingdom. Misfits, mismatches. Let us be misfits in this world because anyone who's a misfit in this world is necessarily fit for the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you, dear God, that your standard which you set originally before sin is still the standard you have today. Father, in 1 John 5, 19, the Bible says, And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. In other words, the whole world is in darkness. And that darkness will not allow people to see that the problem in the world is sin. Sickness is merely a symptom. Wars are symptoms. Calamities are symptoms. Floods are symptoms. The fundamental problem is sin. And sin makes all sinners mismatches for your kingdom. Father in heaven, let the words I have spoken reach someone listening, whether in person or via the internet, Facebook or YouTube, and let that person, dear God, make a decision to give that life to Christ. That he who died to solve the sin problem in our lives may enter into that person's life and make that person fit for a place in his kingdom. Until that day comes, dear God, through the power of your spirit, through the power of your living creative word, make us misfits in this world, and thereby making us fit for the kingdom through Christ. I offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me welcome you to come back tomorrow night. Those of you watching via YouTube and Facebook, invite someone to join you to listen to God's word. God is a strange person. I say that word very respectfully. God may have arranged this entire series to reach one man, or one woman. We don't know. But invite someone. Invitations are powerful evangelistic tools. Just by a simple invitation, a person's life may change. Travel safely. Keep the speed limit. Come back tomorrow night with a friend. Until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Thank you for coming today. May God bless you as we meet again tomorrow.